Would you believe I'm sitting in what was once a dark and dusty two-car garage? Let's back up and check out the steps we took to create this incredible transformation. Okay, this brings us to step one of this conversion project, clearing everything out of the garage and starting with a clean slate. After putting up an inexpensive storage shed in the backyard and planning a future yard sale, we got the garage cleared out pretty fast and realized we had about 400 square feet to work with. We were on a budget, so we needed to make the conversion kind of temporary, meaning we'll have to keep the garage door in place and put up a wall about a foot behind it. For this to happen, I needed to pull the garage door opener components off and secure the garage door securely to the opening frame and seal it really good. Before we do this, we need to go on to step two, plans. Before we do any building, we need to figure out how we want the area to look. I changed my plans for this a few times. At first, I wanted to section it off into two rooms and build a closet, but quickly realized that it was going to take up more time, space, and money. The most concern I had was sharing a room with a big, ugly water heater, so I planned on losing a little space and putting up two small walls and a door to keep us away from the water heater and still leave a small garage area for storage. After I made a final floor plan, I also made some framing plans for the three walls. I wanted to make sure I followed the proper building techniques for everything and framing the walls is the most important step. Doing plans for the wall framing and drywall also helped with my estimating and my shopping list. Step three, preparing your workspace. This is a pretty important step because once you pull the garage door components and secure the garage door, you won't have that giant entryway to bring in tools and supplies. I set up a couple tables with all my tools and supplies and I brought in all the lumber and drywall needed for the project before permanently closing the garage door. The only thing I was going to need to bring through the house was the pre-hung door that we put on near the end of the project. Step 4. Remove that ugly garage door opener. It's time to pull the power on your garage door opener and remove all its components. Our type of opener is pretty standard but there are a variety of different styles out there so make sure you do some research before you start dismantling it. With the garage door in the open position, I was able to remove the cables that held onto the sides of the garage door. You have to be careful because once you remove these in the emergency release bracket on the center track, your door won't have any weight assistance and could slam to the ground when you're lowering it by hand. I put some sawhorses under the door just in case it was too heavy to lower by myself. Since the large spring above the door isn't affecting anything, I just left that in place. Step 5. Wall Framing. It's finally time to start building. The first thing I should note with framing is purchasing your lumber. It is called rough framing for a reason, but you should try to still pick out the straightest 2x4 studs you can find. Normally there's the cheapest 2x4s, then there's some that are a little more expensive that are in better shape and tend to have straighter boards to choose from. I would pick from these and make your project go a little smoother. Starting with the long wall, I made sure there's enough floor space to lay out all my 2x4s and mark them 16 inches on center like my plan. I included a copy of my framing measurements down below just so you can see how framing a 16 inch wall on center is measured. In order to make up the extra space caused by the concrete bases along the bottom of the walls and to allow me to use 8 foot high studs in my wall, I framed an area so I could tilt my wall section into it and fasten it after it was all level and plumb. To do this I used a laser level that projects lines on the floor, wall, and ceiling. I marked all the lines and double checked all the 2x4s before putting them in place. Then I laid out all my 2x4s for the wall on the ground and marked the top and bottom 16 inches on center. After that I situated all my boards where they're going to get nailed and started firing. I'm using a framing gun with 16 penny or 3.5 inch nails. I made the wall in two sections so that I could tilt it into place easier if I didn't have any help. Before tilting the wall up, I put sheets of 7 16 inch OSB board on the back to help strengthen the wall and add a little more insulation to the room. Of course it made the wall section a lot heavier to lift too, so I'm glad I left it in two sections. After I got the wall tilted up into place and made sure it was level and plumb, I fastened it to my framed area on the top and sides. I did the same process for the other two small walls, except I didn't need the OSB board for them. One thing I wasn't sure about was framing the corner where the two small walls came together, so I had to do a little research and figure out how to make a California corner. Connecting two walls at a corner correctly is important because we need to have an area for the end of your drywall to sit on all sides of your walls. The California corner is just a matter of adding one 2x4 turned perpendicular and added to one of the walls where they meet at the corner. Even though the walls are pretty darn secure, I got a hammer drill and some 3 8 inch by 3 inch wedge anchors and put 5 along the bottom of the long wall and 2 on the bottoms of the shorter walls in the garage floor. The walls won't budge after this. Step 6. Insulation and ceiling. Since we're working on an area that wasn't made to be insulated and climate controlled, it's very important to clean and seal around all the new walls with acrylic latex caulk and any larger gaps with an expanding foam sealant. I made sure I sealed around the inside and outside of the garage door and sealed the new wall in front of the door to make sure no water or pests can get inside the new area. 
After the walls are all sealed, I put R13 paper face insulation between all the studs. The paper has some small flaps on the sides that allow you to staple the insulation to the studs and keep it from falling inside the walls. This is another area where you're going to want to wear a mask, long sleeves, and pants. I didn't cover my arms and legs at times and the fiberglass dust left me itching like crazy. One thing to remember is the exterior walls of the garage aren't usually insulated and neither is the attic space above the garage. The way our garage is attached to the house, we only have one wall in the attic that's not insulated, so hopefully that's not going to keep it from cooling down in the hot Las Vegas summer. Step 7. Drywall. Providing we measured correctly for our 16 inch on center studs, the 4x8 sheets of drywall should span horizontally across the studs and land in the center of a stud at the end of the sheet, leaving the other half of the stud to start your next sheet. We're starting at the top corner of the walls and working our way across and down. The long edges of the drywall sheet should be tapered, so we want to make sure to meet up with the next sheet's tapered side, forming a butt joint. This basically just means the thickness of the edges of drywall are the same where they meet. Nice close even joints make for an easy mudding and taping job. Unfortunately your studs aren't always going to be right in line where they need to be, but that's not a problem because we're going to be able to cover any gaps and even out all the offset areas with mud. One tip I wanted to point out is how to properly drywall your doorway. It seems easiest to cut three pieces of drywall to fit on the left, right, and top of the doorway, but what happens when you do it this way is you end up getting cracks running down the seams on the top left and right corners of the doorway. This usually happens from the door opening and closing and shaking the wall. When we use one piece like I did here, you only have two small seams going horizontal that won't be affected as much. Step 8. Mud and Tape. On to my worst part of the project, mudding and taping. You can watch a million how-to videos on this and you'll see how quick and easy it is for experienced contractors. It really is an art form and relies on smooth, steady hand movements and placement of the mud. Filling in the low areas on your walls and tapering the joints to the flat areas and make them all come together for one nice smooth surface on a 19 foot long wall didn't happen that easily. I started off with the setting compound which dries faster and shrinks less and is used for larger gaps of more than eighth of an inch. I filled in all the cutout areas the electrician kindly left behind for me and some larger gaps towards the top of the drywall where it meets the ceiling. After that, I jumped in the mudding and taping with the all-purpose compound. It says it can be used right out of the box, but you may want to mix a little water with it to get that peanut butter consistency. I started filling the seams with a light coat of mud and placed my tape over it and lightly pressed it in place with my 6-inch taping knife. Then I applied a thin layer of mud over the tape. After I finished all the walls, I let it dry and sanded it all down with 120 grit sandpaper on an extension pole trying to make sure I had a mask and a hat on because this produces a ton of dust that doesn't have anywhere to go. The professionals are usually done after this step, but if your walls still have some high and low parts, then you'll need to go over with another coat of mud and try to level and smooth it out a little bit more. After that, I had to do a final top coat and sand it with some 220 grit sandpaper. Even after the extra work I put into getting the walls nice and even, I still have some noticeable grooves in the mud areas, but not too bad. This was by far the worst stage of this project and most time consuming. Step 9. Painting. After cleaning up the drywall dust from the floor and walls, it's finally time to paint. Turns out there's actually paint designed for bad drywall jobs, so that's the first thing I search for. It's basically a flat or eggshell finish white paint that's a little thicker than normal. We covered the walls and ceiling with two to three coats of this paint, and not only did it cover most of the little imperfections, but it brightened the room so much compared to the dark and dusty garage that was filled with boxes and storage items. We chose to just roll the paint on and take our time with this step. It still went pretty quick and we even got the kids to help out. It was amazing how clean and transformed the area looked when we were done painting. We just have one more major step to go to finish this project, and that's the floor. Step 10, flooring. I used a floor scraper on a pole and cleaned up all the clumps of drywall and paint that fell on the floor and dried. Once I got all that smoothed out and vacuumed up, I was ready to start putting down the floor. I wasn't too worried about the paint and stains on the concrete since they weren't thick enough to affect how the flooring lays. I wanted to just lay down the vinyl plank flooring right over the garage floor and not worry about the natural slant of the floor and the section joints in the concrete. I made sure to get the waterproof flooring that already has the padding on the bottoms of the pieces. This was actually pretty easy, but in order to stagger the pieces so it looks like real wood flooring, you need to start each row with a different size cut piece, and the last piece in each row is going to need to be cut just right to come within a quarter inch of the wall. It says to cut the pieces with a utility knife, but I just kept my chop saw around and cut the pieces with that, much faster and more precise. Since the area is a big open room, I didn't really run into any problems with the flooring. Between the new paint and flooring, the room is looking almost complete. After putting in the pre-hung door and applying the trim around it, I added some baseboards to the bottom of the new walls. These three things really brought the whole project together. Let's check out the amazing results from all these steps.